Good morning. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Herbicide Resistance, the Future of Turf Herbicides, presented by PBI Gordon and taught by Travis Tooten, PhD. My name is Lisa Wick. I'm GCSA Senior Manager of eLearning Programs and will serve as today's moderator. We are recording today's event. You'll receive access to that recording as part of the follow-up email. Your audio is muted in this system, but we encourage you to ask questions and as we go along, you can do so by typing them into the question answer box or you can raise your hand using the raise hand button on your GoToWebinar control panel and we can unmute you at an appropriate time. If your control panel is minimized, you're going to see a narrow tab with an orange rectangle at the top. Click on that and that will uh, open up the control panel where you can type into the question answer box. You can also download the handouts that we have available for you there um, so that you can take notes as we go along today if you'd like to do so. Today's session is eligible for 0.1 GCSA education points and at the end of the program we'll give you the code that you can use on the association's website. We hope you find today's event valuable. It's brought to us in partnership with PBI Gordon. With a full line of herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, growth regulators, and other products, PBI Gordon Corporation is a national leader in the professional turf and ornamental management industry. Travis Tooten, PhD, specializes in pesticide and fertility research. He earned his master's degree from the University of Florida and his PhD from the University of Tennessee. Tooten has 11 refereed journal articles and a proven track record in research. His goal is to provide the customer the highest customer experience possible. His business is to provide quality data that is useful to both the customer and the industry. Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Travis Tooten, PhD. Travis? Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate the introduction. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about herbicide resistance and um, and the future of turf herbicides uh, and where we're going uh, from here forever, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, just a little bit of background for me. I run a, um, a well, it's a research and demonstration uh, business The the um, as part of uh, Southeastern Turfgrass Research Center. I run the Florida location. Uh, we done, do lots and lots and lots of herbicide screening and, and for, for that matter, all pesticide screenings. We do herbicides, uh, I mean, um, fertilizers and, um, and uh, plant growth regulators. We do some variety screening. We do a lot of different things. There's also another location, uh, uh, Mike Harrell, uh, location is in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, we work together and we work with basically all of the, the pesticide manufacturers that you would have uh, that we use today. Let's see if I can. All right, so get this thing to work, right? The, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization has defined pesticides as any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, or controlling any pest, including vectors of human or animal disease, unwanted species of plants or animals, causing harm during or otherwise interfering with production, processing, storage, transportation, or marketing of food, agricultural commodities, wood or wood products, or animal feedstuffs or substances that may be administered to animals for the control of insects, arachnids, or other pests in or on their body. So basically, in a nutshell, a pesticide is something you can apply uh, that kills something else. Uh, and that's exactly what a pesticide is. So examples of pesticides would be uh, herbicides, insecticides, nematicides, mollicides, pesticides, avicides, rodenticides, bactericides, insect repellents, animal repellents, antimicrobials, fungicides, and disinfectants. So there is a large category that are pesticides. And we're going to start with pesticides and work our way to herbicide resistance, uh, just, just in general to kind of give you a background of where all of this is coming from. 
So pesticide usage first started in 2000 BC with uh, elemental sulfur and rig beta. I don't even know what rig beta is. Uh, that's terrible for me to say, being my background, but I don't know that. In the 15th century, they figured out they could use arsenic, mercury, and lead. Of course, the health problems that were associated with these were a huge problem. 17th century, they figured out how the nicotine, they could purify nicotine sulfate from tobacco. Nicotine is still used in the neonicotinoid uh, insecticides today. Um, it's a very effective, it's very toxic um, uh, compound. Uh, pyrethrins were discovered in chrysanthemums in the 19th century, and then we have rotenone. Uh, for tropical vegetable roots, rotenone is still one of the most toxic organic insecticides uh, in the world. Um, DDT was discovered in 1939. Uh, this really changed how we did things. DDT, uh, you know, they used it for malaria and things like that with mosquito controls. It really changed how uh, pesticides were used. 1946, 2,4-D became commercially released. Uh, that really changed row crop agriculture because now we could control weeds, especially in crops like corn and wheat. Uh, the triazines were released in the 50s. Uh, we uh, glyphosate that's going to end all of the world, I guess, according to a lot of people. Uh, I don't believe that, by the way. Um, was introduced in 1974. In 2007, there were 1,055 different registered active ingredients uh, on the market or that were uh, registered. So pesticide resistance is nothing new, even though we're dealing with it here in uh, 2019 now. Uh, pesticide resistance was first noticed in 1908. Uh, San Jose scale uh, became resistant to lime sulfur. Uh, by 1957, uh, DD, there, well, there were over 76 insect species that were, that were resistant to certain insecticides, and one of the biggest one was DDT. Uh, you remember that was released about 20 years prior to that, um, and you'll see that those, that happens again and again and again. In the 1970s, we see triazine resistance to the herbicide. That was the first herbicide resistance we had seen, again, 20 years kind of after release. By 1980, there were 428 insects and arthropods that exhibited some sort of resistance to uh, insecticides. So we're not dealing with anything new. Uh, this is something that we've been dealing with for a very, very long time, and uh, it's something that we're going to continue to deal with. It doesn't matter which class of chemistry you're looking at. So was there resistance before 1908 when we first saw resistance? Probably. There probably was resistance. Um, and I'll use a little uh, cartoon here to demonstrate. But you could take this cartoon and put a weed in its place um, because resistance is kind of the same across uh, insects and weeds and for the most part you can put some pathogens in there too so you'll see altered behavior you know uh, so the insects will change how they do things or the weed will grow a different way uh, reduced penetration so there'll be a thicker exoskeleton or there'll be a thicker cuticle on the plant metabolic changes so the the uh, just the way of dealing with the pesticide. We get reduced binding in target sites, uh, increased sequestration, altered target sites. All of these things are transferable from insects and plants. It's a different way of doing it, but, but it happens both ways. So we're gonna move now from just the pesticide resistance to uh, more focused on herbicide resistance um, and how what we do is affecting uh, us in the long run. So we need to first define the difference between herbicide tolerance and herbicide resistance. So herbicide tolerance is the inherent ability of a species to survive and reproduce after herbicide treatment. This implies that there was no selection or genetic manipulation to make the plant tolerant. It is naturally tolerant. For instance, grasses are not killed by 2,4-D. Does that 
now keep in mind sometimes the dose is the poison so will 2,4-D at high enough rates kill grasses absolutely um, but at the rate we're using for to kill broadleaf weeds it does not so uh, but the difference is is because of where the apical meristem is at the plant that grasses you know are much different where their meristems are compared to broadleaf weeds Fusillade does not kill broadleaf weed plants. Fusillade is an ACCase inhibitor. Um, it doesn't kill broadleaf weeds because broadleaf weeds don't actually have the binding site for fusillade or any of the ACCase inhibitors. So this is a definite difference in uh, the binding sites and, and how the weed grows. So this is truly tolerant. Um, That's not resistant. So what is herbicide resistance? So herbicide resistance defined by the Weed Science Society of America is the inherited ability of a plant to survive, reproduce following exposure to a dose of herbicide normally lethal to the wild type in a plant. In a plant, resistance may be naturally occurring or induced by such te techniques as genetic engineering or selective variants produced by tissue culture or mutagenesis. So we could go um, from uh, genetically modified plants such as cotton, corn, soybeans, where they've actually put the glyphosate resistance uh, inside of the plant through genetic modification. This would be resistance. Uh, or we can say the ALS resistant annual bluegrasses we're seeing on the market, or not on the market, but we're seeing in the field today where we can spray the ALS herbicides over them and it doesn't affect them. Um, both types are truly resistance. One is one we have uh, done, the other one is naturally occurring, but it is, uh, is a difference in the genetic engineering of the plant. So um, herbicide resistance was first seen in 1970 uh, and the triazine herbicides. And remember, the, the triazines were developed in the 50s. About 20 years later, we started seeing resistance. Um, in, in 1989, there were 53 species of weeds that had developed resistance. By 2003, 163 species of weeds. So, and in, in, uh, by 2014, we have uh, 420 species of weeds uh, that were known to be resistant. And 22 of the 25 herbicide sites of action at that time uh, were resistant. So it's not a matter of if we're going to see resistance, but when. And at the current pace, we're adding about 11 species a year or so to that, uh, to that list. And it's probably even faster than that. So how does resistance occur? So there's basically two types of resistance. You have target site resistance, which is a change in the actual binding site where the herbicide binds in the plant, or non-target site uh, resistance, which is a change in the uptake, translocation, or metabolism of a herbicide. So the actual, if you could get the herbicide in the non-target site, if you can get the herbicide to the binding site, it will still kill the plant. But the problem is, is getting the herbicide to the binding site. So target site resistance uh, usually is a change in the amino structure, acid, the amino acid structure, or something similar to keep the herbicide from binding uh, and in and stopping the pathway of of the whatever pathway you're running. So in the case of ALS herbicides, ALS herbicides block the ALS enzyme, which blocks the flow of branch chain, uh, blocks the flow that makes branch chain amino acids. So um, the ALS herbicide actually just binds to the ALS enzyme and, and, and makes it inactive. Um, so, but a single change in one amino acid will change the shape of that molecule and the molecule is really big. So if you have a ALS enzyme that's several hundred, uh, uh, the several hundred amino acids long, um, it's not a straight line of amino acids, so it has a shape. It's like a puzzle piece. 
And if you change one enzyme, it can change the shape of that puzzle piece. So now you no longer can fit in your puzzle piece. You know, it just doesn't fit anymore and therefore it doesn't work. Non-target site resistance, again, is, uh, a, you know, a change in metabolism or translocation or something. So you develop a thicker cuticle layer or the herbicide is not actually translocated the same as it, it, it once was. You know, that's a non-target site. And, and most people have uh, horseweed uh, somewhere on their golf course. If you have any kind of native area at all, uh, you deal with this. And it doesn't matter whether you're just about everywhere I've ever been, I've seen horseweed of some sort. And, and row crops, glyphosate-resistant horseweed uh, is resistant to glyphosate because of reduced translocation. Um, it just does not translocate through uh, the plant at all. And so, therefore, it never gets to the binding site, and it doesn't kill the plant. Okay, so while we do this uh, quick poll, I'm sure the audience knows, but translocation, that means where it's taken into the plant and distributed. Is that, am I following correctly? Yes, the translocation is just the movement of the herbicide through the plant, just this move from one spot to another spot. So. Um, you know, maybe from the leaves to the uh, to the shoots to the roots, you know, that type thing. But it's just not moved throughout the plant. And so, I don't know if you're going to cover this in a little bit, but um, so it would depend upon whether the herbicide or pesticide is sprayed on the leaf or enters through the root uptake, right? How that resistance develops so that it can't move through the plant? It just depends on the herbicide. So for each herbicide, they're taken up slightly differently. Um, some are foliar, some are soil, some are both. Um, you know, and in each scenario with the non-target site, uh, it can be slightly different. Uh, so there's no real answer, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So for every herbicide, there's a different way for non-target site. But for target site, which is what we deal with most of the time, uh, that's what – there's just a change in the binding site on the plant itself. And okay. the side of the cellular structure. Does that make I, sense? I think I follow along. Okay, so here we have our poll. Do you think you have resistance at your facility? And this is what the audience said. Aha. Uh -huh. So 41% think that they have resistance. And they may and they may not, but they don't. But we'll tell you how to figure out later on uh, whether you do or don't. But we'll cover how you go about that. And that's a higher percentage of not sure than I would have guessed. I guess that's why we're here today, though. So here we go. <laughs> that is why we're here today. So um, just a little background to tell you, um, I'm no geneticist. So, but I have worked in three different scenarios with herbicide-resistant weeds, not specifically turf weeds. So I have worked with the horseweed. Uh, at the University of Tennessee, my office and lab partner, uh, his PhD project was with uh, with uh, horseweed, um, and then I discovered the the glyphosate resistant annual bluegrass at the University of Missouri, and then uh, we have uh, ALS resistant uh, red root pigweed on uh, my family's farm, and uh, we we won't go into the uh, details of the other um, resistant weeds too much. So we'll just talk about turf weeds right now. So here is a list of the resistant turf weeds um, that we currently know of, and this was in 2014 from uh, Jay McCurdy and Scott McElroy. Um, goosegrass, uh, large crabgrass, lawn burrweed, uh, and in the big ones, POA, POA annual or annual bluegrass is a resistant to four different um, uh, groups of pesticides. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was the one, I don't know if I was the only one that discovered it at the time, but I was the first that, that 
that I know of that has the found the glyphosate resistance in annual bluegrass. So glyphosate resistant annual bluegrass, um, and we'll discuss that a little bit because I'm I'm very familiar with it. So and 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 I took these pictures. The the dates actually come off the pictures. That's how I know what date it was. But it, the pictures were taken on April 28, 2006. But I got a, few, a phone call a couple of weeks ahead of that from uh, uh, the superintendent there, and um, he says, "Hey, we've sprayed Roundup this year, and our annual bluegrass didn't die. Our POA is not dead." And um, I said, okay, we'll all come out and see what's the matter. So I get there and, and we look at what they had done and they had sprayed Roundup at approximately a quart every year for 30 years, I meant for seven years. So 30 ounces a year for seven years in a row in, in February. Now, at this point, I'm you know trying to explain that I don't think it's probably resistant um, because it's you know you're spraying Roundup in February and I and I I said that we would talk about weather a little bit earlier, but weather makes a big difference. So in Missouri in February it's really cold. You know the the zoysia fairways that they have are dormant, but it's so cold outside herbicide uptake is a problem. You know the cuticle layer is a wax layer, and that waxy layer gets very hard just like a wax candle would. And moving a herbicide that you're only getting, you know, two or three percent of the total herbicide inside of the plant in anyways, glyphosate's a really large molecule. And you, you're only really translocating or you're only getting about two or three percent of the actual herbicide inside of the plant. Uh, and then you harden that cuticle layer up. I'm thinking it's probably weather related. But they wanted to know what the problem was. We checked their rates. The rates were even the total gallonage that they had bought worked out to be the right rate for the amount of acres they had sprayed. So the calibration was correct. Um, they were spraying at 90 gallons per acre. I wouldn't recommend anybody spray uh, that high gallon just for herbicides. Herbicides typically need to go out between 20 and 40 gallons per acre, or 20 and 50 if you will, but don't, not much over 50 gallons per acre. Uh, beyond that, you're watering your herbicides down a little too much. Um, so, but I told them not to worry. Again, it was probably just a misapplication, but I took some samples um, to, to make sure. Um, so, but I did notice while I was out there and taking these pictures that I could see where the herbicide, where the sprayer had missed. And so if you look there, you can kind of pick up uh, exactly where he had sprayed and where he hadn't. So there was a streak down the middle of this fairway where there was a lot more bluegrass. So there's probably 10 times the amount of bluegrass here as there is out here. And that did have me concerned. So when we took samples, we did not take samples from this area. We took samples from the area outside of that. We wanted to make sure that we thought we were working, if we were gonna see glyphosate resistance, that it was gonna be uh, that we were collecting plants that truly were resistant. So we put in, in the greenhouse and uh, proceeded to do some uh, some testing on it. So what we saw with the glyphosate resistance uh, population, uh, 16 days after treatment, uh, that's what it means. So glyphosate resistant, GR, glyphosate resistant, POA, 16 DAT days after treatment. Um, and this is glyphosate in ounces per acre. And this was a four pound, uh, active ingredient or three pounds acid equivalent uh, formulation, Glyphosate Pro uh, at the time. Uh, so from, so what we saw 16 days was zero, uh, the, our untreated control, which was zero ounces per acre, all the way up to 120 ounces per acre. So we're almost spraying a gallon per acre of, of glyphosate. Um, that's a whole lot of glyphosate. And if we were, not seeing too many symptoms at the seven and a half ounce per rate at 16 days, I wouldn't be too surprised. But at 120 ounces at 16 days, that this plant should be pretty well dead. So I know at this point we're dealing with true resistance. So what we did see at 16 days throughout all of our sampling was about 45% injury uh, in the uh, resistant population. So 
compare that to the susceptible population uh, it's same 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 exact same we 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 pulled these plants from a known susceptible population uh, off the turf research farm in in columbia missouri and uh we have the untreated controls of 30 ounces. Now you can look at the 30 ounce rate here at 16 days. The plants are pretty well dead. And in a few more days, that plant will be completely brown and dead and gone away. Um, so at the 16 days, we're seeing 95% control uh, with 30 ounces versus you know 40% control at 120 ounces in the resistant population. Um, it truly was eye-opening and not, and really was not what we were expecting at all. This is about 45 days down the road. Uh, you can see the, the zero rate here, the untreated control, all the way to the 120 ounce rate. Now, did the, and, did the glyphosate really reduce the size of the plant? It did. Did the plant ever die? It did not. So, these plants truly were resistant uh, beyond a measure of doubt, and and it was a it was tough to see because now what do you do? We're going to compare that now with the susceptible population uh, from zero to 30 ounces, and you can see even at the 15 ounce rate here, there's a little little bitty plant, but with any competition at all, and say uh, in a turf environment, that plant won't make it; it's going to die. Uh, so, um, you know, we knew that, that there was a problem. So we moved that to the field because greenhouse research is always different than field research. Uh, a lot of times herbicides work much better in a greenhouse scenario than they do in the field. So we had to move, uh, let's go on and do some field work the following spring. So at 35 days after treatment, uh, we have the untreated check. Uh, we put out 15 ounces, we put out 30 ounces, and we put out 60 ounces. You, there's a lot of plants still here at the 15 ounce rate. 30 ounce rate, you can still see quite a few live plants in here. At 60 ounces, you can't really see the plants, but if you remember right, what we saw in the greenhouse was the plants have really were small. They were they were injured, they just didn't die. And if you got down in the turf canopy in this situation, the plants were still there. They did not die. Again, at 61 days, the same treatments, uh, the untreated, uh, 15 ounces, 30 ounces, 60 ounces. You can see at this point in the 30 ounce treatment that the plants are seeding. And, and um, you know, did it kill off a lot of the population? It did, because not all of the plants in the fairway were resistant at this point, you know, just part of the population. So we were selecting for the resistant population as we were, as they were spraying every year. They were slowly but surely killing the susceptible population off and selecting for the resistant population. Again, this is an overview of that experiment in the fairway. So this is very clearly shows how how uh, bad it really was. And we did look at a lot of other herbicides to try to control it. So at this point, was the rate, uh, did the rate that he was using make the resistance? You know, was 30 ounces not enough or was it weather indicated that made the resistance? And my answer to that is no. Um, Rate does not cause resistance, the genes cause resistance. And when you spray something like glyphosate on the plant, it doesn't cause a, a change in the gene structure of the plant. Um, usually what happens with resistance is there's a natural mutation. So every so many seed that's set, um, one will be slightly different. It's just like cancer in a people. When your DNA splits, it does not always line exactly back up and therefore you get cancer. In this case, the DNA doesn't always line back up and it equals resistance. Um, so one in every, so ever many seed will confer that resistance. But that said, if you let plants go to seed, you have a higher seed population. So even though the rate that you put on a, for a pesticide rate doesn't directly 
cause resistance. It inadvertently causes resistance because the more seeds that are in the nat in the seed bank, you get a higher rate of uh, possibility of resistance. So the better control we can have, the better, um, the the less likely we are to see resistance. Lisa, are you there? I am. Sorry, I was uh, okay. had my hand on the other computer. So here we go with our next quick poll. And while the audience is answering the questions about rotating their mode of action, um, there's a question here that's in the question answer box from earlier. What about the influence of pH and surfactants on the herbicide mixes and translocation? Um, pH and surfactants definitely uh, change the how everything works in the plant. And say the for instance, uh, I'll use metsulfuron methyl. Um, metsulfuron degrades very quickly in a high pH. I mean, in a low pH environment, in an acidic environment, metsulfuron uh, uh, degrades in the solution, the in the tank. Uh, where if you use it in a high pH, so you get above seven and you start getting a high pH environment, alkaline environment, the uh, metsulfuron is extremely stable. So pH uh, does make a huge difference in how well your herbicides and surfactants work but they're different for every herbicide and every surfactant load. Uh, so you really have to kind of know what your herbicide likes and what it doesn't like. Um, you know, uh, it, I'll, I'll use another example. Orthene degrades quickly at a high pH environment where at a low pH it's very stable than insecticide orthene. So it really kind of changes through the groups, but it does make a difference. And one thing that I learned from Aaron Patton is that you can water in in your the pH in your water can be adjusted by doing different kinds of things. Um, so there's an on-demand webinar that's available to members that talks about that. Absolutely, you can add buffer solutions um, to the uh, to your mix to adjust your pH so you you stop degradation of your herbicide um, and that that does make a, a large difference uh, in how well herbicides are uh, used by the plant. So is it true when I use the maximum allowed label rate and don't get control it's not resistance and should be called something else? No, that would truly be resistance uh, at that point. It's no longer, you're not tolerant, it's, it's resistant. So uh, if you're using a maximum label rate and, and you're following the label to the law and it's not working anymore, then you probably have a scenario that is that the weed has become resistant. Now some weeds are not always gonna be controlled. So, um, you know, there's always the the weed that's on the label that you'll see the with the asterisk beside it on the label that says, you know, you may, may need multiple applications to kill this weed or use higher rates. You know, those weeds are naturally more tolerant to the herbicide. So it could be resistance. It doesn't have to be. I guess the answer really is it could be tolerance. It could be resistance because some weeds, and uh, I'll pick on Celsius for a minute, uh, dove weed, even though it's labeled for doveweed, uh, Celsius does not do an overly good job of controlling doveweed. It's a good product. It's a great product. Uh, doveweed might be its weakness, um, but it does at times kill doveweed, but it doesn't always. But but even at the maximum label rate, that, that doesn't make a difference. I don't know if I made that better or worse. Yes. Um, but we can see that we have some people who have adopted rotating, about an even number who have not, some in the middle there. So let's continue okay. on and find out more about this. Okay. 
All right. So, um, so what happened in this scenario with the, at the University of Missouri? Um, let me go back a slide. So what happened here? So what happened was is there was a single mode of action over time. They never used any pre's in the fall, no other hard to control, no other methods of control. And, and every time, most of the time when we see resistance happening, it's the same scenario. We've used the same herbicide time and time and time and time and time again. It happened on our farm uh, with red root pigweed. My father only used one pesticide and I told him and told him and told him that he had to switch. He did not switch. It's resistant. Um, it's always the same scenario. In the case of pigweeds uh, and row crops, you know, uh, Roundup Ready crops come on the market. Why would you use anything else? Roundup works so well, you didn't need to spend the money on the pre-emergence herbicide. Well, six to seven years later, they're dealing with resistance and it's a real problem. And it's the same thing that happens in every scenario that we see resistance. People don't rotate. So there are a lot of herbicides. Uh, so there's 17 different categories of herbicides that are on the market. There's 29 different groups. And what I mean by groups, there are multiple levels that are within the same pathway. So they'll be different, they'll, they'll work on the same uh, herbicide pathway, but there'll be different binding sites along that pathway. Um, and we don't get to use all of these categories on turf weed, so it kind of pairs us down to a, a little smaller selection of herbicides. So uh, this is a list of commonly used herbicides by turf grass managers. And what I want you to denote is in this, this table, there's a WSSA code, and this is the code that we'll talk about for the rest of this uh, um, webinar. This WSSA code tells you what the uh, the mode of action or mechanism of action is within. So we know that the ACCAs inhibitors is a, is a group one. The ALS inhibitors is group two. If we change these numbers, then we're using something that has a totally different binding site. So we can use pesticides, say, that are labeled for, to kill annual bluegrass, uh, you know, it's, this time we'll use an ALS group two. Next time we may use a, a photosystem two inhibitor, which would be simazine or, or atrazine. So we can change our groups around uh, to make sure that we're not using the same, we're just rotating our modes of action. In the pesticide labels, you can look just above the trade name and somewhere on the label it'll have the group number. In this, in this case, uh, atrazine is group five. Um, pesticide. So it'll tell you right on the label. So that makes actually rotating your uh, pesticides real easy. And it's the same thing with fungicides and insecticides. They all have these, they're different groups. It's slightly different how they categorize it, but it is, uh, it, it's very easy to understand. So with our herbicide options, um, for pre's, we basically have four herbicide options, four different groups. So we have the cellulotic inhibitors, spectacle flow, and I'll go ahead and tell you that I don't endorse anybody for their products. Um, I'm just using these trade names because they're, most people are familiar with them. Uh, if I start putting up a bunch of um, active ingredients or, or the common name, you're not, not everybody's going to be familiar. So I'm going to use the trade names, but I'm not endorsing anybody's products. So, in the case of cellulotic inhibitors, it's a group 29 spectacle flow, long chain fatty acid inhibitors, 15 pennant magnum. Um, there's four of the pre's. Uh, we get down to the selective post herbicides. Now, this is not going to include like the ESPS synthase, which would be glyphosate, but the, these are the, these are selective post herbicides that we can use in turf. So there's a pretty good group, ALS inhibitors, by the way, there's a, error on this slide. ALS inhibitors is a group two. Um, so right here it should say group two, but uh, there's there's enough herbicides that we can rotate without any problems and, and therefore we can help uh, keep from having resistance at, at, at the golf courses. So here here's a slide that I borrowed from Ramon Leon and, and Brian Unruh and uh, they put this out in 2015. Um, but it just shows a 
you put out a pre uh, this year, uh, next year, a uh, photo system two pre, next year maybe a cellulotic inhibitor, next time we do a, my, a mitotic inhibitor. Um, and then we always want to follow our pre's up with some kind of post control. So if there are escape weeds, that we don't let those weeds go to seed. That's real important in managing resistance. You don't want the, the weeds that escape go to seed because if they are truly resistant, now we have a bigger resistance problem next time we use that same pesticide or herbicide. So, and then again, you may take a, a this year we use a photosystem two for your first application. You follow it up that same year with a cellulotic inhibitor and then maybe follow this over and then just follow the chain down and around. Just keep the, the point of this whole slide is to keep moving your modes of action as much as you can. So, you have to decide on the scenario by the weed control. If crabgrass is your main concern, then you might need to do your dinitroanilin this year to keep your herbicides or to keep your, your crabgrass under control as much as possible. Then next year, you may want to switch to, you know, Ronstar or Oxidiazon. Um, so if your main uh, weed is, is a uh, goosegrass, then you may want to use Ronstar to start with, and then next year we'll switch to Spectacle. We'll go into that uh, further. But the point is, is you got to know where you need to start on your course when you start talking about rotation. You know, you need to start with your best herbicide, which you probably have been using for years already. And if that's the case, then you need to start switching uh, to something else. But remember, rate equals resistance. So uh, indirectly, right? So I've heard Dr. McCarty and Dr. Yelverton say multiple times that two pounds of active ingredient of Ronstar will give you about 90% control, 95% control of goosegrass. Uh, but you still got 5% that you've got to take control, you've got to, to do something with, either post-emergence or whatever. Um, or if you can go to three pounds active ingredient of Ronstar and you'll get near 100% control. People say, well, it's too expensive. I can't do that. Well, if you start leaving that 5% population to go to seed, then you're going to increase your chances of resistance and, uh, and you still have to control it post emergence, uh, at most facilities. So in goosegrass pre programs and warm season turf grasses, you may look like something like this in year one. So we'll, we'll start off with a Ronstar, uh, Pre, and I'm not going to put rates in here because it, that all these rates vary on where you're at in the country and your soil types and stuff. So I'm not going to get into that. There's too many scenarios to go over, but I'll just give you some herbicides that you can use. So in warm season turfs, you can use Ronstar to start with. You follow that up in 60 to 90 days with spectacle. If you're as far south as we are in Florida, you will probably want a third application if you if, to stay 100% clean. Any escapees. When the, when the, you know, you're come back with a post emergence application of maybe speed zone followed by speed zone 30 days later because you have speed zone plus Syncor or something like that 30 days later because it requires two applications for the speed zone Syncor application or, or you may follow and then follow that up with a tribute total to get 100% control. I know these scenarios are very expensive. You have to figure out what scenario you're in and then try to make sure you're rotating your pesticide chemistries or your group numbers to to cover you so you're not uh not causing resistance again the next year you may decide to start with a spectacle follow that by a ronstar follow that by a barricade um and then your post-emergence treatments are different the point is just keep changing your your uh um your pesticide group numbers again in cool season turf uh, you may start off with a Ronstar uh, this year and next year and a speed zone because your seasons are so much shorter um, and a speed zone to control it uh, this year and then the following year go to a barricade, which may not be as good as uh, Ronstar on goosegrass and then follow that with Pilex. You know, there are options that you can uh, do and just keep rotating through those uh, those different group numbers. Annual bluegrass or poa annua, again, you, this is where I see most people fail with annual bluegrass is they don't do the pre-emergence applications. Um, 
pre-emergence is if you want if you're intending to control annual bluegrass you really need to put out a pre in the fall so uh you may this year start off with a pre of ron star follow that uh up early in the fall october uh november don't wait till or you know you want it to be germinated but really small small poa is a lot easier to kill than big poa you know with an als inhibitor and then follow that up in the spring uh or you know once you're completely dormant with with curb um the next year you may do a uh um a fall application of barricade follow that up you know again early post with atrazine and then an ALS inhibitor uh, late spring to clean up any escapees. And these are the scenarios where you really keep from getting resistant annual bluegrass and it'll help you with your resistance management. So um, other species that we are having to worry about at this point, Kalinga. Um, there's really only three modes of action for Kalingas and the nutset species in general that are effective. Uh, MSMA, which is not labeled in all states, so there's a lot of states you can't use MSMA in anymore. Um, still extremely effective, no problems with resistance there. Um, however, uh, the states like Florida, California, a few others where you can't use MSMA, uh, you have the PPO inhibitors, which is Dismiss, and then you have the ALS inhibitors, Sedgehammer, Monument, Catania, and there's a whole list of those. Um, it's important that you follow the label. Uh, so you may use a, two applications of a PPO inhibitor this time and then follow that next time with two applications of an ALS inhibitor. I am going to go ahead and tell you that I'm not a fan of one application of an ALS inhibitor. Two applications is always better. Even if you say, well, that's too expensive. You need to just, you can cut the rates on ALS inhibitors a little bit so you can use the lower end of the label rate and then follow that up 30 days later with the lower end of the label rate and you'll get far better control than you will one application of a higher label rate. Um, but again, keep rotating those group numbers because if you don't, we will lose it. And, and everybody's seen how bad uh, Kalinga can be because it's all the way up into the Northeast now and it's moving it all, all across out of the Southeast. So it's, it's a tough weed and it's uh, voracious. It moves, it moves pretty quickly. So this is uh, directly off of Bear web Bear uh, website. So if you look at the bottom, you'll see that it's the back by Bear, um, and I and I literally cropped it right off their website. So common, this is Table One. Common pre and post herbicides used selectively control annual bluegrass, crabgrass, and or goose grass in cool or warm season turf. It's important to tank mix or rotate different types of herbicides and modes of action. When possible to limit chances of resistance, be sure to check specific labels for use in your turf species. Many of these products are not made by Bayer. You know, these products are not made by Bayer. There are lots of them. All of the major manufacturers are concerned with resistance. They would they like to say, man, we want you guys in the southeast to use spectacle and spectacle and spectacle and spectacle. They do. They want you to use it. So they want you to use it appropriately and let's not try to, they don't want to lose spectacle. They want you to say use spectacle this time and then follow that up with a, uh, a dimension application next time or a Ronstar application in the following time. They, they want you to use their products, but they're also concerned that they're going to lose those products. And that's the last thing that they want to do. So tank mixes, so I, I, I like to see people use tank mixes or pre-mixes that have WSSA codes. And so, um, you know, I want to see like a speed zone, for instance. Uh, thank you, PBI, for this webinar. Uh, but speed zone is a product that has uh, two different WSSA codes. And uh, with that, you're putting out multiple modes of action. That really usually gives you better results from the herbicides that you're using. And it also allows you to put a little lower dosages of the herbicides out. Now, you want to use the maximum amount of herbicide that you can without turf injury. So you have to figure out on your facility what that level of turf injury you can withstand is. 
and then um, you know make sure you're staying within the label rate. But if any time you can mix multiple modes of action, uh, you, you you should. I mean that's a, that's another way of helping to prevent um, resistance. And, and I won't tell you to just say you lose ALS, you got ALS resistant annual bluegrass or or something like that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use ALS herbicides. It just means that you may need to tank mix them because some of those herbicides kill lots of weeds, not just annual bluegrass. So it doesn't mean you don't use those anymore. You can still use them for other weeds and other species. So you say, I oh, mean, I got to kill the Kalinga, but it doesn't kill the annual bluegrass anymore. Still use it in a mix, but just know that, uh, you know, that your ALS herbicide is not killing the annual bluegrass anymore. It's, you know, it's killing the Kalinga at this point. So the label is the law and it always will be. So make sure that you're following the labels for your area and region and state. And uh, that way uh, you're not uh, doing something that's wrong. Just make sure that you're still switching your group numbers when you're applying these pesticides. And I have to interject speak, here, Travis, because okay. um, one of the things that I normally do in webinars is I say the label is the law because Hava McKeel, our government affairs person, um, wants me to do that. And so when I saw this um, slide in your presentation, I thought, oh, that's really great. Um, but I knew there would be people who would be disappointed if I didn't mention that. Um, one of the questions that has come in, and there are several, um, is about the WSAA codes. Um, and it says, code. looking at several of my labels, like Ronstar, Dismiss, and PGR, there's no group number on that label. So I have provided there the link to the Weed Science Society of America's website. There is a lot of information available there um, for people to review. It may take them a little while to find what they're looking for. Um, but I didn't know if you had a, any input on that where those codes might be found. Mm -hmm. You can you can actually just Google the codes. That's where I found them. Um, I just I just Googled the codes for all that. That I didn't I didn't I don't know the codes off the top of my head. Um, so that's exactly what I did. I just went on Google. Googled you know uh, the WSSA is Weed Science Society of America. Um, but I just Googled WSSA uh, herbicide codes, and that's where I found the group uh, codes and. You got to remember, most of this stuff is geared around uh, um, row crops in America, not turf. Turf, because even though we have more acres, is a very secondary crop uh, when it comes to the pesticide use. Um, so, uh, but it's they're not too hard to find, and I think most people are adept to Google at this point. Was there another question? Um, why don't you go ahead and close out and then we'll do because there are several. Okay, so uh, if you think that you have uh, um, resistant weeds on your facility, so I would tell you to get a hold of Jim Brosnan at the University of Tennessee. He, uh, he and Dr. Scott McElroy at Auburn work together on resistance and resistant management. And they're, I would say, the two leading guys that I know of right now in the country at this. Um, but Dr. Brosnan has um, a testing facility, so you can send him in the weeds, and he will actually test the weeds or, or uh, and help you with your problems at this point. Um, this is uh, my facility at uh, in in Anthony, Florida, and uh, we're currently, if you see the the and you can see our, we have a large farm, but the but but this is all in irrigation at this point. It wasn't when I took this picture a couple of months ago, um, but all of that is in irrigation, and we'll all be in turf shortly. So we're quickly growing, and uh, and then we have the facility in Lexington, Kentucky. This is the facility that Mike Harrell runs, and again, lots and lots and lots of research we we run. Uh, last year, I ran over 80 trials by myself, so uh, we run quite a few trials. We test a lot of different pesticides. 
And I think that is uh, it for me. So I will be glad to take any questions. Thanks, Travis. There are quite a few questions before I go to those just quickly on the slide. February 26th, PBI Gordon is sponsoring another webinar, uh, POA on Bermuda grass greens, which I see a typo. Rats. Um, we appreciate uh, PBI Gordon sponsoring this today. The code that you will enter on GCSA's website is 999-224-32-29604. Um, if you're listening to the recording, be sure you do it uh, the date that you are listening. Okay, uh, here's um, a question that is a point of clarification from earlier. When you were talking okay. about metsulfuron, uh, did you say it yes, degrades above pH seven or below pH seven? Uh, it degrades. It degrades in an acidic environment. So below pH seven, it starts to degrade pretty quickly. So if your water at your facility when you're making a mix is uh, real low pH, then you will need to add a buffer solution. So like with metsulfuron, you would never want to add like uh, ammonia sulfate or an ammonia sulfate containing surfactant to that because it would lower the pH of the water. So metsulfuron is much more stable at high pHs in solution. Okay. What is the effect of aerification on pre-emerge treatments? Um, that's a good question, and and most of the research shows that there is not much effect. Uh, you got to remember, you're opening up the soil. You know, the the key ingredient to weeds to germinate is uh, sunlight, water, and and uh, and that's it. You know, a space to grow, really, right? So when you open up the soil to the sunlight, and there's a weed seed there, there's always that opportunity to grow. But for the most part, if you have a pre-emergence herbicide application down, um, those herbicides do travel in the soil. So they're not gonna stay completely put. The, usually the one that I think is staying home the most is barricade. Um, and it still only travels an inch or two, but you're not gonna have verification holes bigger than that. So if you have a pre-emergence application down and you're you know, need to air fry, I wouldn't start, you know, if you're 90 day or 60 to 90 days out, now you probably need to reapply uh, directly after your airification. Okay, it's, it seems almost every herbicide can eventually elicit a resistant response, yet I'm not aware of any resistance to MSMA whose use is allowed things. every place but Florida. Why is that? Um, it, MSMA is a is a massive cell membrane disruptor. With it's their mode of action is not totally well understood, but just the way it works and the way it disrupts the cell, um, it's that's more or less exactly why. It's just it. I think it kind of hits the cell on multiple fronts, and and that's the reason it is. But there is I, I've not heard of any resistance to MSMA either. I'm not saying there's none. I'm saying I haven't heard of it. Right. Um, is it helpful for neighboring courses to use a different rotation of pre and post herbicides, thus requiring neighbors to share their plan for control? I don't think so. I think that, I mean, obviously, if you, you know, if everybody can, you know, kind of get on the, the more you can share with your neighbor what's happening, you know, maybe everybody benefits from it. Um, however, uh, I don't think that what he's doing next door, as long as he's rotating like you're rotating, then I think that you'll be covered. You know, uh, there's no perfect scenario. Resistance is going to occur at some point with all of these pesticides. But, uh, but I think that as long as you're doing your due diligence on your golf course, you can really help ward that off. You know, the, the Educating the golfing public is a big thing. For like POA, glyphosate resistant POA, you know, the golfers just need to clean their shoes. They need to clean their spikes. You know, that's that's the key thing there, you know. Or if you're getting a piece of equipment, you're borrowing a piece of equipment from another golf course, just make sure you wash it really well. 
uh, to try to keep from transferring the seed mechanically. What about aeration on warm season grass? What and, about your, it? and your pre emergent. So, I mean, like I said before, just make sure that, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna aerify, um, you know, you can go ahead and get your pre emergence out in the spring and then because you're not gonna airify and, and I don't think many people will be airifying and maybe there's there's obviously scenarios that people do, but you're not gonna be airifying in February. Um, so but you get your pre emergence out and as long as you're not close to the end of your herbicide activity, go ahead and airify and you can go ahead and put out the uh the pre-emergence herbicides, you know, right after aerification or right before aerification, I would tell you to put, do your aerification and go ahead and get your pre-emergence herbicides out. Most of the pre-emergence herbicides do have slight, I mean, real slight post-emergence activity, but it's not much. So, uh, but if, you know, if you get it out while that weed seed is germinating, they say the seed takes seven to 10 days to germinate, you have a little window between aerification and when you have to get your pre emergence out. You know, you can't wait two weeks and expect it to work, but if it's three days later, it's not going to make any difference. How can you find out if the herbicide is more efficient in a high or low pH situation? Ooh, that's a toughie. Um, you know, most of the ones I know, I just know because I've learned over the years. Um, I would ask your sales reps for the most part. Most of the time, those uh, questions they can answer pretty readily. You know, if you got a really good uh, sales reps, whoever company you're using, if that guy's pretty knowledgeable, most time they can answer those questions. And you know, I wouldn't get too caught up in buying all the real fancy high-priced surfactants. Most of the time, that's exactly what they are. You know, make sure you're using a good surfactant, and then you know, again. Let Google be your friend. Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff's pretty easily found on the internet these days. You can also listen to Aaron Patton's "How Does pH Affect Your Soil or Affect Your Tank Water Mix" that we have recorded. Exactly. Um, we want to thank one. PBI Gordon for their uh, sponsorship of this webinar today. They will be at the Golf Industry Show booth number. 3436. You can stop by and uh, talk with them about uh, pH of their products. Seminars are starting to sell out. So if you haven't enrolled, you should probably do that. Um, there are a lot of different tours and field trips and activities that will be taking place not too many days from now. Getting close. It is. I'm not seeing any other questions here. Um, any other closing remarks for us, Travis? I just want to thank everybody for listening today and, you know, um, being diligent turf managers. And, uh, you know, it means a lot that you're willing to get this education. And please take that education and share it with the people who are not on these, you know, I don't know how many people are uh, listening today, but, you know, take the information you learned and share it at your GCSAA meeting. Uh, and therefore, you know, we can help people understand uh, what we're up against because there is going to come a point in time uh, where we don't have as much to work with as we currently do. Excellent point. Um, this information will be available as a recording you will get access to that follow-up that email will also have information about where you go on GCSA's website to enter the code that you see on your screen now thanks Travis so much for providing this great information to us today I thank everybody for attending again thanks to PBI Gordon and I hope to see you all online again soon have a great day thank you